This part's a short one on the subject of Lilith. Never heard of her? Fairley says that in nearly all cultures she's a female demon. And the most commonly accepted myth about her from the Jewish Kabbalah is that she was the original wife of Adam in the Garden of Eden, predating Eve. Well, that's true, but therein lies a problem. As we've noted earlier, the Kabbalah is a very late text, and certainly worthless as a historical source about Adam. Now, in light of all this, we have to ask, why bring this up at all? It's not really clear. Fairley seems to think that all the later mythology associated with Lilith existed at the earliest stages of the character, although that's not true. He says that since the 1800s there have been more sympathetic portrayals of Lilith as a noble goddess, but he doesn't tell us who made their portraits or why, or why we should be bothered. <coughs> I can tell you that one such portrait was made by an artist named John Collier in the late 1800s, but as one art analyst says, this isn't really a sympathetic portrait. Beyond that, Fairley may or may not be right about the use of Lilith by certain feminist quarters. That could be true, but even if it were, it would just be a case of them misappropriating the character from a very late and unreliable version of her story. I'm also not going to comment on Fairley's perception that maybe Lilith is an actual demon currently in charge of things like lesbianism. Frankly, there's no need to add that kind of paranoia into the mix of what's already a serious social issue. This vid gets a rating of a quarter tank. The next section is on a place called the Bohemian Grove. Fairley is right about it being a playground for the elite. Where he goes overboard is where he refers to it as hosting a druid pagan ritual called the Cremation of Care. Well, it's not a druid pagan ritual. What happens is that an effigy called Dull Care is cremated beneath a huge statue of an owl, the camp's mascot. It's a sort of outlandish drama to symbolize that the people are there to relax. In that sense, it's kind of like performance art. Other conspiracy theorists have said that this ceremony is for the purpose of magically alleviating the cares and concerns of the elitists making the sacrifice. But in reality, this is no more magical than one of those goofy seminar tricks where you put on the Abe Lincoln hat and a sign that says honesty. Some conspiracy theorists have bought into the notion held by equally loony radio host Alex Jones that this was some sort of reenactment of a Canaanite ritual. Not that Jones is any kind of expert on Canaanite rituals. But I imagine one could find a resemblance as long as you squinted real hard, stood on one leg, and put a gorilla on your research panel. Nor is this any dark secret. Some claim that Americans were not aware of this ritual until Jones snuck into the grove and filmed it, but you can plainly find it referenced in the 1975 book The Bohemian Grove and Other Retreats. There's even a 1918 book, The Grove Plays of the Bohemian Club, produced by the club itself, which tells of the origins of the ceremony in 1880. You can also find it described in the 2008 book Conspiracy Theories and Secret Societies for Dummies. So while this cremation of care ceremony is pretty goofy, it strikes me as the sort of thing some extroverts do to get in the mood for whatever it is they like to do. It's no goofier than Fred Flintstone putting a buffalo skin on his head, or as noted what might go on at a seminar these days. It's not sorcery, and it isn't sacrificial ritual. It's just goofy. Now all that said, how much of this does Fairly fall for, and how much does he add? We already know to be suspicious of such claims, but let's grant for the sake of argument that these transcripts are accurate. Let's see what they actually say. Now despite Fairly, there's no reason to make more of this than there is and say this is some hearkening back to Satan as the Prince of Tyre, and that care is some sort of code word for conscience. In fact, if you take the poem at face value, it's equating care with Tyre and Babylon as bad things to be gotten rid of. It's also clear that care can't be conscience, as this line further on shows. In addition, if you read through the transcript as it's posted, it's full of really silly stuff like rhymes and over-dramatizations. Claiming there's some sort of dark meaning doesn't prove there is one. It just begs the question, and is also conveniently non-disprovable. Fairley doesn't go with the understanding of the owl as a Canaanite god. He thinks it may be Lilith or Ashira. He doesn't give any reason to think so, so there's not much I can say in reply. 
Now what about this group called the Knights of Axar Ben that fairly claims does a cross-destining ceremony called Hijinks in Hades? <coughs> well, it's a real group to be sure, and it's headquartered in Nebraska. They do a lot of civic activities, and they were founded somewhere around 1895 or so by Omaha businessmen to promote patriotism and advertise the city of Omaha. Today it still has its own foundation, but is cross-dressing part of the mission? Not that I can find in any reliable source. The only sources that mention such a thing are all conspiracy theory sources, not historians or news reporters. Fairley's going to have to do better than that. Fairley closes this section with a comment on an owl alleged to be on the $1 bill. That's again a case of imagination plus paranoia. As Fairley admits, some people see a spider. I've also seen people think it's a skull. The reality is it's just part of a background pattern used all over the dollar bill, as one layman commentator noted and as can be verified by looking at the dollar bill itself. In close, Fairley goes back to the Bohemian Grove and its mascot, the owl. The official line is that it represents knowledge. Fairley doesn't say, but apparently believes that it's some sort of symbol for paganism, which is known only to the initiated. I think all we need to say in reply is, prove it, and don't use circular reasoning to do so. This vid gets a quarter tank. On this part, Fairley begins some material on economics, a subject he admits he finds confusion. Well, let me suggest first that you don't alleviate that confusion with a source like Pastor David Jeremiah, who also knows nothing about economics. It is probably Fairley's confusion which also makes him take what's really an easy way out, namely thinking that there's some sort of conspiratorial aspect to the way the world economy is run. That's not to say there's not some sort of structure to it, or that there aren't individuals or groups that act as power brokers to manipulate the way the economy works. But that's just calculated self-interest. It has nothing to do with the occult or with secret societies. Well, no, usury has nothing to do particularly with creating money out of thin air. And usury in modern times isn't simply lending at interest, it's lending at unfair or an excessive interest. In biblical terms, Fairley is only partly right. Usury was inclusive of lending to fellow Jews with interest. It was allowed in the case of a loan to a non-Israelite. This would have had a great deal to do with ancient principles of loyalty to your social in-group. How does it apply today? That's a matter of debate. I know of some cultures where the biblical model is still used and where families loan money amongst themselves without interest. But that was done precisely because you already owed loyalty to your family. Usury was charged to those outside the group precisely because you couldn't count on group loyalty and support to see the debt repaid. In the modern world, we don't think much of that kind of loyalty. Borrowing money from your family is sometimes frowned upon as being too much of a mama's boy. But it's a surety the biblical law would have had nothing to do with a formal lending institution like a bank, because we don't work on the basis of in-group loyalty when we use a bank. Fairley also points to the example of what he calls the money lenders Jesus drove out of the temple, but that's not really relevant. Those people weren't lending money for loans. They were conducting currency exchange where people would turn in their foreign currency for forms of money that would be acceptable in the temple. Jews came from all over the Roman Empire with local currencies and had to turn them in for the right currency. Of course, there was plenty of potential for abuse, but it had nothing to do with lending money. I'm not an expert economist either, so unlike Fairley, I won't pontificate on this subject further. But I can agree that yes, debt in this society does create obligation. But that's how it was even in biblical times and even under God's rule. As I've discussed in some of my other vids, God plays the role of a powerful patron to whom we enlist ourselves through Jesus as broker of God's covenant. In the Old Testament, the arrangement was God as suzerain, with Moses acting as covenant broker. A covenant implied a circle dance of obligation. Keep in mind what Paul says, you've been bought with a price. The real problem with debt is when you make your own choice to get too deep into it and impose too many obligations on yourself. Hypothesizing some sort of shadow government isn't necessary. It's just a convenient explanation for people who are frustrated by a trap they've been put in, mostly by their own lack of self-control. This vid gets a rating of half a tank. <laughs> <laughs>